So now we get into some of our themes. The first, I added one here if you didn't notice. The first is religion. I find that um, this was not as prominent in the movie, but the author started this book by writing a short story about people who were at a Bible study, but they were really just using the Bible study as a place to gossip and show off their um, their new clothes and things like that. And, and that God and faith really were not a part of this Bible study at all. And he that's where he started. He started there with writing a short story. And I think because of that, um, religion is kind of a theme that that permeates throughout the book and we see it in a few different places. Um, so this is one of the places where I do think he's being a little bit satirical. He is holding these people up to criticism. Some of the characters talk about, for instance, going to Methodist camp, even though they're Buddhist, um, or uh, hiding the fact that they're Hindu. But most of the characters identify as being Christians. And I think that part of that is to show that the, the people in this very wealthy country have been affected by colonialism. Um, and when the British colonists came in and they brought, in, in this case, unlike some other countries, but in this case, they brought wealth and shipping and, um, and uh, you know, some of, some of the things that we talked about earlier, um, they also did bring in their religion and they would have likely missionaries who um, would would minister to people and, and that kind of thing. So we have a number of scenes, um, you know, in the in the chapel during the wedding, for example, people comment on whether or not it's appropriate the way that it's been. Uh, decorated. We have a couple scenes of a Bible study. We have people commenting here and there on um, things that Jesus said, even though sometimes they are not things that Jesus said. Um, there are things that, you know, uh, other world leaders or other, you know, religions or, or what have you um, have, have proclaimed. So, it's interesting that um, religion is one of, and we'll talk about the rest later, but religion seems to be one of these markers of wealth that you're wealthy and um, and you're sophisticated and you go to the right schools and therefore you're also a Christian. Um, and so that's something I want you to look for because I think, you know, in some of the other stories that we've looked at, religion and faith are much more personal. And here it's much more um, corporate and it's just something that they do in society, but it may not really be that authentic. So I guess that's um, what the authors kind of try to show. The racism in this book, um, you know, it's interesting because it opens up with a scene that takes place in the 1980s, so long before the, the main events of the book. And um, I feel like I can give it away because it is the opening scene, so it's the first thing that you're going to read. But basically, um, Nick and his mother and his cousins and some of his aunts, they go to a, uh, a, a hotel and their, their reservation is not being kept. And it's pretty clear that the clerk not keeping their reservation is doing that because they're Asian. So this is a very posh and swanky hotel. And he asks them to leave. And instead, um, they have a contact with the person who owns the hotel. And they make the owner an offer he can't refuse. And they buy the hotel. And then they tell the clerk that he can leave. And this is um, interesting because this is one of the only places that we have uh, Nick's family and his and people from his society outside of Singapore. And it's kind of showing how they're treated by the rest of the world. And um, certainly Nick kind of has found his own place being a professor in New York City. Um, where he has kind of acceptance there and, and nobody really knows about his his family or, or their wealth or anything like that. Um, having said that, the racism in the book then is primarily within his family and his um, and this wealthy society. 
this very upper class billionaire society um, toward other races. So there is a, a question as to what where Rachel is from. Um, and they think, is she from Taiwan? Is she from China? Um, please don't let her be from this area or that area. Um, they also talk about, and this kind of goes back to religion, they talk about different people's religion um, and kind of, again, connected to what race they are. Um, so that, you know, people who are Buddhist or Hindu or, or what have you are looked down upon. Um, they have also servants and they're very particular where their servants come from, um, which countries and which regions their their servants um, are from. So, for example, they mention like if you want a Swiss or a French au pair for your children, that's going to cost you a lot more than it would um, to just have maids from, uh, for example, one of the Southeast Asian countries. Um, and many of them have servants who have been given to them um, by uh, royalty. Um, so that's something that has apparently been passed down that these servants um, keep coming from from this different these different regions. So I'd like you to kind of look for that and kind of compare the racism at the beginning of the book to the racism that we see throughout the rest of the book. Um, gossip, gossip, gossip is interesting here because normally I would call gossip a motif, something that is repeated and kind of happens more than once throughout the book. But in this case, I do think that there is a theme of the the detrimental effects that gossip can have and also the beneficial effects i guess once in a while the fact is that because you know i showed you guys pictures i'll pull it up again because this is such a small island um super small <laughs> because it's such a small island it really is like being in a small town or village where everybody knows everybody's business and sometimes um the gossip seems harmless so oh who is you know so and so bringing to the wedding and um oh they were uh, an actress so let's talk about that what were they in were they any good are they do they have money is it new money will they know how to behave and it seems kind of harmless um other or you know what did so and so wear to the 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 Bible study and was she showing off her new purse or how much did somebody spend um, for their bachelorette party, how much do they spend per person? But really, what when you look at what happens, um, many of the characters are negatively affected because of this gossip and because they're being talked about um, and rumors are being spread about them that may or may not be true. We have information about where Rachel's family is from you know, her actual origins and, and where she was born and who her parents actually are. We have, inform, you know, and speculation about that. We have speculation about um, whether somebody should, should be dating um, a man who is a millionaire but not a billionaire. Um, and, and we see that this girl is in love with somebody and her life is kind of being ruined because of this conversation. We have a lot of gossip about, um, clothing, about, um, how much is, is spent on, on what and how many things and, and that we see affecting somebody's marriage where, um, you know, the, the wife and husband don't normally talk about those things. Um, the wife is wealthier than the husband and she doesn't want him to feel, you know, the effects of her wealth. And we see how he is affected by it and how it kind of breaks their marriage apart a little bit or at least um, begins to. So I'd like you to kind of look for that. The, a lot of times, you know, I said this book might seem silly on the surface, but when you really dig in, um, what is actually going on with these people and these conversations that might seem kind of silly or frivolous actually have some weight to them. Then we come to the family and the matriarchy. So what I think is interesting 
is that in some ways, the Singaporean society seems like, that's a lot of S's, <laughs> the, it seems like um, it's a patriarchal society because a lot of emphasis is put on the young men of the family um, to carry on their family legacy, their family name, etc. Um, they are primarily the people who are working. Most of the women um, don't have jobs per se. So they might have, um, for example, they talk, I mentioned Astrid has a, a lot of real estate. For the most part, her parents are buying that for her. And um, so it's, it's this kind of generational wealth and the way that they're going to pass it down and how they're trying to make uh, comfortable lives for their children and that kind of thing. So on the surface, if I told you um, the men have jobs and they work and the women don't um, and they have things like they have a lot of we'll get into this in a second, but they have like a lot of charity work that they do and, and they travel quite a bit and those kind of things. Um, you would maybe think that it was a patriarchal society, but in reality, it is the women who are really running this society. Um, they are coming up with the rules that are, I mentioned, unwritten rules about um, proper behavior. They are the ones who decide kind of who gets in and who doesn't. Um, they are the ones who really are kind of controlling everything behind the scenes, who's marrying who, um, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. Um, we have people who wanted to sabotage Nick and Rachel's relationship, and um, his mother is entirely on board with that and kind of orchestrating it from behind the scenes. Family, though, is extremely important. And this is a, a difference from a lot of Western or American society where we, we put a lot of emphasis on the individual. And in this case, the emphasis really is on family. So when Rachel um, does a few things to show that family is important to her, that she's willing to make sacrifices for family, um, she is looked upon with a little bit more favor. Um, Nick is really pressured to move home to Singapore from New York so that he can be with his family and take care of them and kind of take over uh, their legacy and, and all of that kind of thing. So um, look for the family structures, look for um, the ways that in many instances the fathers of the this family kind of seem absent um, or at least a little more disinterested in, in the, the, the society, um, how money is being brought in and, um, and how the women are kind of creating this matriarchy. Those are things I'd really like you to look for and the separation of the genders as well. So just lastly, I tacked this on the markers of wealth. Some of these I've mentioned before, um, Status symbols, you know, they're using religion as a status symbol. They're using servants as a status symbol. Um, it's not, I will say, it's not unusual to have servants or help in some of these countries if you have money because many people are still um, poor and struggling. And so if you have servants, it is kind of sometimes a way to help people. Um, I had a story from somebody I knew who um, lived in, I think, India, and he said that, you know, the family he was living with had domestic help and servants and that um, those servants sometimes hired other people to do some of the lower chores or the, the things that they did not want to do. So, for example... Um, one of the maids hired another girl to come in and clean the bathrooms and the toilets and all of that. And he kind of was taken aback by that. Like, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to do that work. It's too low for you. And she said, well, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but also, if I pay her to do it, I'm helping her family as well. So I'm getting, you know, money for helping them. Um, and she's getting money for helping me. So that can kind of happen, but for the most part, that's not how they're treated in this book. Um, they're really just kind of there and a note that 
the family has a lot of money and where their servants come from, as I said before, makes a difference to them um, because they are kind of being um, prejudiced against people from different countries or um, people of different ethnic backgrounds. Other markers of wealth, the clothes. Okay, this book describes clothes more than any other book that I've ever read my entire life. Um, they talk about designers and which clothes are appropriate for which season and what are you going to wear for the wedding and you have to have not just one outfit for this wedding, but probably five or six because the wedding's going to take place over three or four days. Um, clothing is a huge thing and the ostentatiousness of some people's clothes and the quiet simplicity of other people's clothes. Um, Astrid in particular is like a, a fashionista. Araminta, who's getting married, is a fashion icon in Singapore. So what she's wearing and what her dress is going to look like and, and all of that. It's huge, huge gossip. <laughs> a lot of gossip around that. Um, other markers of wealth, the houses, um, how they have them decorated, where they're located. There's um, a long passage of Rachel going to Nick's um, home, family home, uh, owned by his grandmother, how they get there, what it looks like, how it's kind of hidden away, um, what street they live on. So all of these kind of things um, are markers of wealth, uh, where they're flying, how they're flying to places um, that they, many of them have... Um, land and houses elsewhere. So they have a place in Malaysia, a place in London, um, all of that kind of thing. And um, certainly, again, you know, the religion is being used as, as kind of a show of wealth as well, that they're above the other, you know, Asians in that area. Um, if it meant something to them, it would be a big deal, but it really kind of doesn't. So I'd like you to look for um, all of the markers of wealth that you see, the status symbols for the men and the women, and also um, how, how a lot of it just doesn't matter. <laughs> Who cares if people are talking about you and gossiping about you? Who cares if somebody wears the right you know, the right dress from the right designer. Why does that matter? Um, why does it matter so much to the people in this book? Um, yeah, so so those are some of the things I would like you to think about. Just to kind of recap, um, this is a country that is very dense with billionaires because of its history. We're going to see some of the people talking about the history in the book, um, what happened uh, during the war and before the war and how they got there, who has new money and who has old money, who's been there and established and who's these, you know, it's called nouveau riche, that, that's the new wealth and they just don't know how to behave. Um, is he writing this as a satire? Is there exaggeration or um, is he just kind of showing things as they are? In any case, where is he holding them up to ridicule and criticism and where is he celebrating them? Because again, this is a book about Asian wealth that he, you don't really see that depicted that many places. A lot of times we see the immigrant story as we did with um, joy luck club of people coming to the united states other times we see people really struggling and and being in impoverished circumstances but in some ways he is celebrating this culture and in other ways he's kind of making fun of them um where are some of those rom-com tropes and um where are they kind of being subverted um and kind of changed around a little bit to to have a little bit of a different spin on a traditional romantic comedy how does the style and narrative point of view change from chapter to chapter and then some of those themes religion racism gossip uh the matriarchy the the markers of wealth or the status symbols where do you see those in the book so I really can't wait to hear your thoughts on this, and I hope that you also enjoy the video from the author that I'm providing for you. Um, it's a really fun book, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.